welcome back to an episode of the Grateful Redhead Podcast. I'm Angie Ringler, your host, and today I am joined by George Siegel in my own state of Florida. Welcome, George, to the show. Hey, Angie, thanks for having me on. Yes, I'm very excited. Actually, George had me on his show a couple of weeks ago, and we love the interaction so much that I invited him on, on my show. So this is going to be a really great conversation of allowing the podcaster to now showcase what it is that he's doing and what he's interested in currently. Now, George is also a documentary filmmaker, and I believe he used to be a weather, a TV weather forecaster. Is that right? Yep. I started as a TV weatherman and I was also a morning show host. I did sports. I did a game show pilot. Um, I hosted a weekend sports trivia game show. So I've kind of done everything um, in front of the camera and then transitioned that career to being behind the scenes as I got older and, and less desirable to look at. Um, it's, it's easier to be behind the scenes than it is to be in front of the camera. Well, you know, we are video recording this, so you're in front of the camera again today and you look great. I know you're, exactly. I know you're sporting some merch today, which I love. Uh, I think that's really cool. Yes. Move the world films. Yep. The move the world films t-shirt. Yes. So, you know, we will yeah, talk about lasthousestanding.org. We have our copy. Link. We, and we're going to talk about both those things that he just brought up, which is move the world.org uh, and also the last house standing. For me, it, it really touched me. I, you know, living in Florida, being living through two very, what I would call devastating hurricanes that sent me off the grid. We had no power for like 17 days. I had never experienced something like that even though I was born and raised in South Florida. And, you know, we prepare well, we board up, we have supplies. Nothing can prepare you for being hit by a storm and you swear for hours your roof is going to fly off. You swear for hours that, you know, water is going to come barreling in through that huge piece of board that you've got up on your window and you can hear it moving. It is scary on so many levels. And I know for people listening today, you've probably been through your own scenario of a scary storm. Um, but this, this documentary that you did was on the, uh, the, in Mexico Beach, there was a terrible hurricane that like devastated the whole community. And there was one house standing, hence the last house standing is your documentary. So tell us a little bit about why that interests you and why you decided to make the film on that. Well, I actually had the name before I found the house. The house just fit. It's like if you ever watched the Brady Bunch growing up where they they turned Greg into a rock star because he fit the suit. So that house kind of fit the narrative of what I was trying to do with the film. It's just tragic what happened there. And it's a story that I, I saw from back in my days of doing weather. Every year we would have tragedies like that, not necessarily of the same scale, but neighborhoods that would get wiped out by tornadoes, people that would flood, houses that would burn down. I mean, it's a constant churning of disasters that goes on around the country. And, you know, you mentioned uh, lifelong Floridians. Those are probably the ones that I would worry about the most in a disaster because the ones that move here know what they're stepping into and they take steps to possibly be prepared for it. The ones that live here that have survived all these years don't really worry about it. So most of my neighbors that are lifelong Floridians don't have generators. They live in wood houses. They live in houses that are at flood level, not above flood level. So those are the people that are ripe for disaster. People like me make sure my house is 10 feet elevated. I have a generator. I make sure it's concrete block. I know that everything is photographed if I have to get an insurance claim. There's so many things people can do to be better prepared, but they don't. So that's what motivated me to make the film is a wake-up call to people that you just don't think disaster is going to find you, but it eventually does. And then the question is, are you prepared for it and how will you uh, rebound from it? And the thing that is not calculated into the cost, you know what your house might be worth, you know what your insurance costs. It's all the stuff that happens to you after a disaster that we see in the film, when you lose everything, when you have to rebuild, when you have to find a place to live, when your job goes away because the, the place you worked was destroyed by the hurricane, the school is damaged. I mean, lives are turned upside down again and again. And I think it's something that we need to put a stop to and, and, and we can change it we just can't wait for the people at the top to say, okay, we're looking out for you. Now we're going to make some changes because that'll never happen. No. They can't agree whether the sky is blue. 
True. So we have to look out for ourselves. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, I remember when I was younger and they would tell us, you know, have three days of supplies when the storm is coming, you know, be ready for three days. And then at some point it went to seven. And I thought to myself, where now that then I was older, right? I had my own home. I had my own things to worry about. And it was like, who comes up with this random seven day number even? Where does that come from? So it seemed, okay, I'll, I'll go by what they say. But then to experience it and be 17 days without electric, being 17 days without food being brought into our local grocery stores or gasoline stations being open, it becomes very scary. And I remember that we had huge trees down everywhere around our home. And of course, after the storm finally went by and we assessed some of the damage, we're like, okay, we need to get the chainsaw out and get some of these trees off of our home and off of our property. Well, guess where the chainsaw was? In the shed that also had a huge tree on top of it. You know, it's got these results that you can't even plan for, no matter how well planned you think you are, you can't plan well for it. And then two days in, generator gave out, you know, because we don't, we don't test it, but once a year it gave out. We actually had to drive four hours just to get a new generator and get gas, which was really scary on the way back because we had a, um, a pickup truck at the time and we loaded up a bunch of gas cans in the back of the pickup truck. And the closer we got to South Florida, of course, there were no street lights. So, you know, you kind of had to come to this rolling stop at every intersection. But the closer we got to South Florida and people are walking because a lot of people don't have gas and they, you know, they have nowhere to drive to, we could actually read people's lips. They were like gas and they're looking at our, you know, truck. And I'm like, honey, don't stop. Like, just keep going. We have to get to the house. It becomes very scary of the things that we don't even think about. And that's really what you mentioned there. Like we can prepare for the storm when it comes, but how do we prepare for the after effect of now, where do I go work? Now, where does my family live? Yeah, there's no training. For- Nothing. There is no training for that. No. And, and you don't know how people are going to react. Somebody who's hungry and you're the one with food, you don't know what boundary they're going to take. Um, and, you know, when, when disasters bring out the best and the worst in mankind, it always brings out with first responders that are saving lives, um, neighbors that are heroic, that rush in to save people, firefighters, all these people that do heroic stuff. And then there's that other element that sees it as an opportunity to make money. So your roof is leaking and they offer to throw a tarp on your roof for $10,000. Or some contractor drives by and says, if you assign your insurance benefits over to me, I can get your house fixed quicker and it'll put you in the front of the line. And then you sign off on that because you're desperate. Right. You, the person who drives up to your house is your white knight who you think is going to save you. And it's not always the case. Um, and it, so it brings, I always equate it to, if you've ever turned a light on at night in the, in the in summer, you flip a light on in a field and you see all the bugs and things that come out. That's what a disaster brings out. You know, the first wave is the people that could actually save your life and help you. But then the people that are the low lives, you have to be careful of. And that's what you don't want to become a victim of. Yeah. And they're, and they're really, like you said, there really isn't any training for that, nor is there any preparation of how do we handle that? Um, nobody ever talks about it. Um, and it's only brought up until when you start to see this stuff on the news. Um, so, you know, speaking back of the last house standing in Mexico beach, I think a lot of people probably still remember seeing that picture of the devastation of all the houses gone, but yet there was that one house just standing there. And we wonder how does that happen? Can you tell us how that happened? Why is that house still standing? Sure. And I actually got blasted by a guy who lives there that says, you made it seem like there was no other houses. Well, the shot doesn't lie. You know, I'm sorry to that guy. The, the shot is the shot. I took the shot. We were there with a drone and there were no houses around it. Now, there were other houses that survived in Mexico Beach. Not every house was destroyed. But in that area, they were absolutely leveled or uninhabitable after the storm hit. In this particular house, they went 28 feet into the ground with pylons and then the house was 15, 20 feet up in the air, and it was built with not building to code, but to survive the disaster that could possibly come. So they built that house to withstand a Category 5 hurricane, and that's what hit them as a Category 5 hurricane. What's fascinating to me, and I've had this conversation with um, 
construction experts and people in, in the building industry that are very knowledgeable is Mexico Beach is not building back to a standard that would survive the storm that wiped them out. So if another Hurricane Michael hit Category 5, the rebuilds wouldn't even survive because they raised the wind rating from 130 miles an hour to 140 miles an hour. I mean, that, you know, maybe it cost too much money. Maybe people couldn't afford to, to rebuild if, if they had to build to a higher standard. But the South Florida standard of 170 miles an hour seems to be the way anybody that lives in a hurricane area should be building to right. um, because you see what the damage can be. So you're really just rolling the dice like we all do that it's not going to happen to you. Right. We all hope that it's not going to happen to us. And unfortunately, we're seeing more of it, that the storms are getting bigger, weather's getting more erratic. Um, I know I've seen firsthand, you know, flooding in the streets in Miami when it's not raining, like that's bizarre. You know, these things are happening and, you know, look, life is busy. I don't want to pay attention to those things either, right? I got enough going on in my own house and what I've got going on in my business that keeps me busy and entertained. I certainly don't need to be dragged into all of those things, but in a way, we're all part of this environment and the environment's going to drag us where it wants us to go. We don't have the ability to say, well, you know, we're just not going to be hit this year. Hurricane season is coming up soon, you know, in Florida. We're recording this now in March. You know, pretty soon we're going to be dealing with this all over again. So is there anything that you learn making the movie that is valuable to people who either live here already or who are thinking about moving to Florida that could help help us all to survive these kind of storms? Or is that really coming down to codes and how we yeah. build things? Well, there's a lot of things, you know, doing nothing is going to accomplish nothing. So we start from that point. There was a disaster management expert in our film, uh, Joseph Barbera, who said, hope is not a strategy. So if you're hoping something's not going to happen, that's not your winning strategy. So, the, so you look at what can I do? The first thing is you need to get your house inspected to find out what your vulnerabilities are. If you have a sea level house and the storm level in your neighborhood is 10 or 11 feet, you already know you've got a problem. So I would make sure I had flood insurance in that instance. And I would understand what the policy covered and what the policy didn't cover. Because you can't have that argument after the fact. If you're going in to try to prove something to an insurance company, you better have the, the, the right on your side because their goal is not to pay you. I don't care how those Allstate commercials look like or State Farm or whatever, where it looks like, hey, they're just handing out money. They're just there to help you. No, they're not. You know, their goal is to not to find a way not to pay you. And they may argue with that. But think of any time you've ever had to make a claim. They do their investigating. There's a reason they make a lot of money. They're not stupid. So if they don't have to pay you, they're not going to just hand you a check. So you need to document everything in your house. You need to have proof that you had that big screen TV, that you had that classic car in the garage, that all the things that you're claiming, you better show them you actually have those things. You better be able to prove it to them, which means keeping it in the cloud or keeping it in a, a waterproof area where you know it can be safe, that you can produce it. The cloud is probably the safest place. So those are things you can do right away. There's things about how are your walls bracketed to your roof? Is there any kind of insulation in the attic that could keep your roof from blowing open, uh, blowing off in a storm? Will your front door blow in? You know, when we first moved to Florida, we had some friends, we went over to their house and their front door opened out. And I thought, what idiots, who would want that? It's so unwelcoming and a door opening out. You want a door that opens out because it's not going to blow in in a hurricane. Right. And we don't think about those the, things. The, the pressure is different. Because that's probably something that they're doing. Yeah. In I later. called them to apologize, by the What's way. What's that? I called them and apologized for making fun of them once I found that out. I know because I don't know of any home. I feel like that's probably later construction. That's not even something that they used to do, right? Isn't that newer? Yeah, you see that on some houses. It's a design change because a lot of houses are step down when you go out. And I think by code, you have to change that because somebody won't see it if they're going out the door, mm. if they're not pulling the door in. So, you know, but usually your patio door and your back door is all open. Out. out. It's the front door that's the problem. And there's things you can buy. There's a Kevlar hurricane blanket you can buy for your front door where they put the screws around the outside of the door and then you put this blanket on and it can withstand things blowing into it up to 175 miles an hour. 
So not having your wow. front door blow in could save your house. And I used to never notice these things, but now when I walk around my neighborhood, I see those holes around people's uh, doors. Yep. Um, there was, uh, there's, there's different kind of grates you can put on your, um, on your garage. And there's um, a, a product that opens in and then goes, opens out, depending on how the flooding is going. And it stops water from uh, debris from blocking the water flowing in and out of your garage. I used to never notice those. Now I see so many houses with those. So there's a lot of devices, a lot of things. All that information is on our website, um, thelasthousestanding.org. There's a resources page on there. And I encourage people to go there and, and start looking into what you can do to make your house safer. And another thing that always gets me, Angie, is that May is when they have hurricane preparedness week. It's too late, too late. by May. Yeah. That may be a good time to get water and flashlights, but it's not a good time to start fixing your house. Now is the time to start fixing your house. Especially those bigger things like that. Number one, you've got to budget those things in. That, those are above and beyond our normal expenses. So, you know, to say, okay, I'm going to buy these specialty items for my garage or my front door, like, we have to prepare for those things in our budget. So that's a really interesting tip. I've never heard about the Kevlar blanket. I'm definitely going to just jotted that down. I'm going to look into that because our door opens in and that's always kind of been, you know, the, the joke is like, well, you know, what happens when our, you know, our roof blows off or our doors open up, you know, it's, it's a very, and you could order that right away. It's, um, it's a very scary situation when you're thinking of that, especially when you're in the midst of the storm. Yeah, that's not the time. It's like uh, we talked to a guy who's a fire expert out in California. And when they had the Malibu fire that we had in our film back in 2018, uh, people woke up that day and were told to evacuate. People had to panic and all these different things. He goes, nobody wakes up the day of a fire and makes their plan. You do that months in advance. You know, it, it's nothing can be done once the disaster is happening that's going to protect you other than maybe getting out of there safely if you had to evacuate. But where do we hear about most people getting killed when they're outside in a storm trying to evacuate? So a lot of times you have to just say, I'm staying where I am, or you had to have left early. You don't want to be those people sitting in that 50 mile traffic jam on right. I-95 going, I'm all right, where up. am I going? I got to get out of here. Cause that would be horrible. Yeah. And then well, yeah. we're going to go North and then the storm turns North. <laughs> we're going to go South and the storm, storm turns South. Like, you know, you can't really gauge those things very well. Um, I remember, you know, coming. No, because what happens? People people flee from here to Orlando, and the storm turns and hits Orlando yeah. instead of Tampa. Right. So you know, you could be running to a place. I, I'd like to believe that, in my mind, I'm in the safest place I can be, and I don't know how well that motel on the highway is built, or wherever I have to go to that shelter. I want to know that I control what my um, initial safety might be so I have a better chance of surviving. That's a really great point. If we do those things now and look at that resource guide on your website and say, okay, I'm going to do the best I can do within my budget, within my ability that I can prepare for now, it will be the safest place probably that you could be. Now, if you're in a mobile home or you're right on the ocean and you're not prepared for those things, that's a totally different discussion. But for the most part, we can take more control over the things that we have at home. Um, it's, it is a very scary situation. I remember that when the storm came over for the, for the first time, the eye passed over. And, you know, it's a very awe, awe-inspiring moment when you think your roof is going to fly off. And then minutes later, it's the most beautiful day outside. And you, you know, there's no yeah. rain, there's sunshine, there's blue sky. And I remember we walked outside and the whole neighborhood came out. You know, everybody was out in the streets and you're just looking up. It's beautiful. But that's when you look down the street and you look further and you realize that every power pole is snapped in half like a toothpick. And you're like, holy shit, how is that ever going to get fixed in a reasonable amount of time? And then before you know it, within a few minutes, the winds start to pick up again and you're back inside, back to that very scary moment. It's Mother Nature is fascinating and scary and beautiful and must be respected in so many ways. So I'm glad that you made this film. I'm glad that you were able to pull all the resources together and, and give us all one place to go to to find out how can we better secure where we're going to be because it's not a matter of um, if it happens, right, it's now 
when are you going to be in that scenario? Because it's going to happen, especially with the people migrating to Florida. I mean, right? <laughs> Pandemic brought so many people to Florida and uh, that doesn't change. I feel like it's been that way for a long time and probably won't be changing anytime soon. So thank you. Yeah, we need to close the border to Florida. Nobody else can move here. It's getting too crowded. <laughs> it it's killing our real, it's making our real estate go through the roof. Um, you know, if people go to the lasthousestanding.org, that's where the resource page is. They can rent the film on there so they can watch it and see what we're talking about. And if you go, I don't want to give that movie guy $3.99 for his film. If you have Tubi, it's a, it's a cable channel that you can get online, T-U-B-I. You can watch the film for free, but then you have to watch commercials. So, but it is available for free on there, or you can watch it and, and rent it on our website. And you know, you talked about uh, mobile home parks. That's like the da most dangerous place. They seem to get it in every kind of disaster. Yeah. I saw a funny meme that really wasn't funny. I think it was a far side meme where it showed a tornado holding a mobile home and it was asking Google for mobile home parks near him, a mobile phone. And it was saying, Google, find mobile home parks near me. Oh. Um, and that's, they get hit by every disaster. Yeah. So if you live in a mobile home, you have to have an evacuation plan and you have to make sure you have the right insurance. And for when you were talking earlier about, you know, if you don't have the money to fix up your house, at least insure your valuables and know where you can go to be safe in a storm because not everybody has the luxury of fixing things. We have to be uh, understanding of that, yeah. but there's still things everybody can do to at least protect what you do have. Yeah, and let me tell you, you totally reminded me today when you said document all your belongings and that's something we did years ago but it's not something we've redone. And that's what I realized when you said that was that, shit, I, I gotta do that. Like I have bought different things since we did that for the insurance policy. I've gotten rid of things, brought in new things, and those are not accountable right now. And that is something I'm taking from this talk today. And this weekend, I will definitely be taking my phone around and just recording everything. I used to take pictures, but that was before we had all this cloud ability and stuff. And now I just go walk around and I do a video and I pretty much narrate what I'm looking at just for my own clarity. And I feel like it, you know, it's better that they know what I'm trying to point out and know what it is. You know, like I bought this a year ago. This is a 2000, you know, and 20 television or something like that, because you might not have access to all those receipts of the things that you bought. And depending on the kind of coverage yeah. you have, is it the, there's two kinds, right? Is it the replacement value or the purchase value, I think is what they call it. So those are definitely things to, to check out and talk to your insurance agent about and making sure that you have the right coverage because you might not be paying for the right coverage, but yet you'll pay for it later when they try to give you um, value of it and not replacement value of it. Because as we know, prices are gone crazy in the last few months and then things Things are not going to go down in price. They're not going to become suddenly more affordable after a storm hits. So this was really good things that we touched on, even for my own value today. So I hope some of the listeners are also getting, you know, this kind of value out of our talk. Um, and I am, I, I feel everybody should owe it to themselves to at least go check out the resource. And, you know, why not watch George's video or movie for $3.99? Seems like a very good investment. Um, what I also want to talk yeah, to you. Yeah, and you, and you know what that Go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say one more thing about this is that people have to realize that, you know, you, you get one shot at getting this right and, and the disaster, the cost of that is so life altering. You really want to avoid ending up in that situation. And if it, that means having an insurance guy explain your policy to you, because with what one of the disc jockeys, uh, the morning show host in uh, Panama City on the Kramer show told us he had call after call where people had never even read their insurance policy. So they were a lot of them weren't even covered for a named storm, named storm hurricane. So you have to understand, don't just pay for insurance and think you have it. Understand it and understand what is actually covered by it, because it's false security if you think you're covered. People aren't, you know, their their house has gone up a million dollars in value. They're never going to be able to rebuild that house. So you need to know what you have and have if you can't read it, have somebody explain it to you. And that's what our agents are there for, right? I mean, that's what there, yeah. therefore, is to help us, to guide us, at least at minimum, explain it is what we're writing the checks for. So that was a good, that was a good finishing yep. point on that. Thanks. Um, what I did want to also bring up today, which we touched on at the very beginning, is 
tell us how to make it better, which is also, which is your um, way to kind of bring these small businesses to light of things that people are doing to improve situations, you know, the world themselves, uh, sharing it with others. How did you, why did you decide to start that? Well, I thought it would be an interesting way to introduce people to other people who actually, rather than just complaining about problems, actually went out and tried to solve it. And that was one of the things that fascinated me about you. And I, lo I loved about your business is you had a business, you identified a problem and you just go, ah, you know, I'm not going to do this anymore because I'm not, I, 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 I don't want to use plastic bottles, but I can't figure out how to get around this. You changed your whole pitch. You changed your product. You changed how you send out your product. And to me, that embodies what I wanted to do with the podcast is show people that problems can be solved. Here are problem solvers. And if you have ideas, don't be afraid to try them because look at these people. Look what they've done. Now, they may be smarter than us. Like I, I told you, you're far smarter than I am to be able to design a product that you could change. Whereas if I could tie my shoes every day, I guess I'm having a good day. But well, thank you, George. Um, I, everybody can solve a problem if they put their mind to it. And I want to encourage people to do that. And that's what got me interested in doing the podcast. And how long have you been doing the podcast now? We have 28 episodes, so one a week. And, um, you know, it's, I, I encourage people to just give it a listen. Just check it out. I try to make them less than 30 minutes so people can get in, get out. And um, each title of it gives you a very good idea what it's about so you know um, and, you know, they can listen to your episode. There's a lot of environmental ones on there. there. There's people, there's a woman on there who started a business where rather than kill trees when they build houses, or if you want, if there's a tree in your yard, you don't want, they, somebody will all come and take the tree or buy it from you. And she found a guy that had a $7,000 tree he was going to rip out of his yard. And he got seven grand for the tree to have somebody come and take it for free. You know, they didn't, he didn't, she, he didn't have to pay to tear it down. So that's a creative business. And you think there's a lot of different ideas out there that people have that can make our lives better, can make our lives easier. And those are the people I love to interview for the podcast. That's really cool. So of course, I would definitely encourage everybody listening here to go listen to my episode with you, of course. But give me an idea to somebody like the tree lady who found this really cool niche that would also solve a problem and make her some cash flow. What what other people did you interview that you were like, wow, that's pretty amazing? You know, I had on a, a young woman a few weeks ago who is a TikToker and she's with a bunch of other people. TikTok is a like a foreign language to me. me. Too. You know, I have had limited success on there because a lot of it is is lowbrow stuff. But they do environmental education on there in these 15, 20 second, 30 second snippets. And some of them get a million people looking at them. And I think that is fantastic when you can do something like that because it just exposes a whole other audience to the fact that there are environmental things you can do. There are things that you can do in your everyday lives that aren't that difficult to do that can make the environment be a, a step towards a better environment that can be, you know, less waste, less recycle, le less throwing things out. I had a woman on who wrote a book of 52 things you can do to combat climate change. And I was, you know, I rolled my eyes at first when I saw that and then I go, wow, I'm doing some of these things. But then there were other tips that she gave us that were as simple as rather than drive around for 20 minutes looking for a parking space, know where you're going. And, you know, that's a simple thing, right? But you think of the gas you're using yeah. um, a as you're driving around, um, food that you throw out every week because you have leftovers and you don't eat them. So be more economical in what you're buying and what you're consuming so you don't have as much waste. And so I'm always meeting interesting people, a guy who wrote a book on resilience that talked about how our, poorly our houses are built and how we need to do a better job and that we need to do a better job. We need to demand more because builders are lobbying to have lower building standards, not higher standards. They're not saying, hey, let me spend more money on your house. They want to build it as, 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 much, of, as much of a profit built in as possible. Yeah. So it's, it's, every guest has been interesting in their own way. You know, I had a guy who wrote a book and his, his goal is to try to make people happy and and have a better attitude. Another woman who talked about giving people hope because they live every day with no hope of the future and how you have to be a better neighbor and a kinder person to give people hope and a reason for being. So the tips can be varied 
to those things, to, to ones like yours, which again, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to just pat you on the back. I really was impressed. And I think that stuff like that needs to be shared with people so they hear about it. That's great. I truly believe that too. And which is really why I started this podcast to kind of reach out to more people and being able to see what, what are people interested in? Honestly, conversation and storytelling is the most powerful tool that we probably have to share information and become inspired well outside what we think our own abilities are. And I feel like that's what, that's what you're doing. You're allowing people to see what's well beyond where we think we can grasp because we are much stronger than we give ourselves credit for most of the time. I thought it was funny. You just mentioned like 50, absolutely 52 tips that the girl gave for climate change. Um, I, uh-huh. somebody told me the other day to watch a, um, I think it was a TEDx on a guy who did a talk on 52 uses for vodka and drinking is not one of them. <laughs> and I thought, you know, here, this guy is really yeah. thinking outside the box and he's trying to give us, you know, ways to utilize it more from that, you know, like, especially with the hand sanitizer thing that was going around. But it's, it's just the idea that people are thinking well beyond themselves and really kind of stretching the imagination and the abilities that we have, because I think sometimes we get bogged down thinking that we're just, we're not smart enough or we don't have what it takes. And I feel personally, because I'm not a huge fan of, of, I guess, social media and what I feel are the negative parts of it is that we, we, and I talk about myself first, is that judging my accomplishments or what I'm doing based on what I'm seeing from other people which is why I don't really enjoy getting on social because I feel like instantly I'm comparing myself or maybe I should be doing better or why not? Why am I not doing that? Or how can I do more in my day? Instead of stopping and saying, look at all I've done, look at all that I'm doing. Just like when you mentioned reading that list of you know, 52 ways to you know, combat climate change, you were already doing those things. And it was nice for somebody to remind you to also pat yourself on the back and say, look at the things that I'm doing and take those moments of appreciation for ourselves. So I think that's really cool. Yeah. I mean, it's a nice validation. Yeah. I'm a little more competitive in, in a sense <laughs> that sometimes social media drives me crazy yeah. as a former broadcaster. A viral video for me is like the elusive thing that, that we all chase. And I put out ideas that I think are funny or, or, or witty or helpful and a couple hundred people see it. And then some kid lip syncs a song who's got acne and is probably 100 pounds overweight. He gets a couple million people look at it and they have him on the Today Show the next day talking about it. That stuff makes me pull my hair out because there's no rhyme or reason to what works. People make their choices based on whatever reason. That kid may not survive that 15 minutes because he's going to go back to his life after that. And that may have been his time. But people like me, people that think they know what they're doing, live for hoping that that happens. And even in that, hope's not a strategy, right? <laughs> it's, you just don't know what people are going to consume, but you don't let that stop you from doing it. You keep trying. Hope is not a strategy. Fits many situations, not just a hurricane. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This has been really Final good video. talk with you, George. Like I, I love that you're bringing all this thing to light and you're providing a space for people to really learn more about it. So I encourage everybody to, you know, listen, it, I encourage you, obviously, to listen to George's podcast because he is bringing on some amazing people and not just myself, but podcasts, when people take the time, like, I feel like a lot of people don't even understand the work and the effort that it takes into putting on a podcast, not just from the editing point of view, but, you know, finding interesting people to talk to and really wanting to connect and really wanting to bring these stories to life. So I thank you for taking that time and doing what you're doing with the podcast and taking time to make documentary films about such important topics that could be life-saving. And that really matters. So I thank you for making time today I appreciate to, that. to be on my show. So where thank can people find, on, I really appreciate uh, go ahead and let us know again, where people can find the film and also where to listen to your podcast. Okay, so the film is on uh, thelasthousestanding.org is our website, and you'll see the link to the film is on there, the resources I told you about. The podcast is on every platform. I have a, a website, tellushowtomakeitbetter.com, okay. 
a lot of words to put in, but it's they're not complicated words. So tell us how to make it better.com. You can get the podcast there or it's on Apple, it's on Spotify, it's on every platform you could possibly imagine. And all I would ask is for people to just give it a listen, for your fans to just tune in. I'm not trying to replace anybody. I think there's room for Angie and George in the podcast world Definitely. and probably hundreds of other people. But just drop in and let you know, check it out. Let me know what you think. If there's things you don't like, if there's things you don't like, um, I would love to hear from people. That's a really good point. There is plenty of room for all of us. And how I like to finish off my episodes is to remind people that if they know somebody cool like you that I should be talking to to make sure that they connect us so that I can get them on the show. And my guess is that you would feel the same way, that if you know they know somebody out there who's helping to make things better, get in touch with George Siegel, get them on the show. Let's, you know, let's get the word out there of this amazing stuff that's going on all around us. So um, for those listening today, I hope you enjoyed the show. I know I enjoyed my time with George. I got a couple great notes to do, and I've got some things to do this weekend to firm up my insurance policy. Um, So until we all meet again, please be kind to each other and love one another. Peace out.